Now, I said, I was thinking this week about uh, these uh, baby bottles, and, you know, these baby bottles are meant to be filled not with coins or change like we're doing for our little drive, but it's, it, it's meant to be filled with, what is it called? Milk. Baby stuff. I'm looking for the women to help me out here. I got some thing that there's a there you go. Formula. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. You know, the other thing is, that, you know, these are pretty small bottles, but that happens what's happened when a man orders the bottles. Uh, because I was like, they in very sizes. So I thought they were so anyway. But, you know, the goal is to fill this up. But it's not to be filled up for the sake of the bottle. It's to be filled up for the sake of the baby. This gets filled up so that it may be a life-giving source or a life-sustaining source. To a baby. Now think about that analogy because we're looking at a text this morning where Paul uses the term fill. And he's going to tell us to be filled. But it's important for us to remember when he says this that it's not only for our own benefit that we're filled, but we're filled so that we may be a life giving and a life sustaining source to other people. So if you'll track with me this morning, we look in Ephesians chapter 5. We walk through uh, this section of the, the book of Ephesians. This is kind of the last one on this particular section as it wraps up this chapter. But in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, into these verses, we're looking about verses 18 through 21, into the chapter. It should be in your bulletin there. You can read along with me. And we see here that Paul is going to say something that to me is quite intriguing. And as I've studied this over the years, my view on what he means has actually changed. I'll share a little bit of that with you. But let's read it first and we'll go back and take a look at it. Starting in verse 18. See, here's the problem with you losing your eyesight. You have to find it. Okay. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now there's one primary command in this, and it is to be filled with the Spirit, and then there are four phrases that modify that, and we're going to look at what that means to be filled with the Spirit, and then the four phrases that explain that to us in very practical terms as we gather together as a body of believers. And so the first thing we're going to see is just what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Now, I don't have time to go into all of this, but you've probably heard terminology like baptism of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, filling of the Spirit, and you wonder, are those all the same things, or are they different? And I want to offer to you that there are different nuances of that as you read through the Scriptures. They all have a unique meaning to what the, the Scripture is talking about. And even though I term this time, the sermon today, walk in the Spirit, um, it's really not exactly the same as walking in the Spirit as you read in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about walking in the Spirit, and that has to do with your openness, what the Spirit is doing in your life, within a life of obedience. But this idea of filled with the Spirit is unique, and this is the only time in the Scriptures that it is, in some way, commanded. And so, <clears throat> I did a study a number of years ago, because I was curious uh, what that meant. Now, I was raised with a little bit of a Camps Crusade background on this verse. And Camps Crusade would say what it means to be filled with the Spirit is has to do with two things, confession and then receiving the Spirit. Uh, but then basically with what I would say is just obedience. Time in His Word, prayer, fellowship. And, and as I started looking at that, I was like, okay, that's walking in the Spirit. That's, there's, that's good Christian truth. But what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? How does that term uniquely used. And as I did a study of the New Testament, uh, I found one thing very interesting, and that was almost every time filled with the Spirit is used, there is a verbal expression of that filling of the Spirit. For instance, Stephen, when he's stoned, says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he preached a sermon. And we see that throughout the book of Acts, where somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit, and the result of that is some form of a verbal proclamation of the Lord. Now, that filling of the Spirit is also something that is something that you can see in someone's life. In Acts chapter 6, there's a divisive issue in the church, and the apostles come together and they say, Look, it's not, 
and for, for us to attend to solving this problem, but choose from among yourselves men who are, and one of their qualifications, are full of the Spirit. So it had to be something that the people could look at and say, that person is full of the Spirit, is filled with the Spirit. Now it's interesting that just a few chapters later is when Stephen, who is one of those that is chosen, is actually stoned because he gave a pro verbal proclamation. And so when I see that, I, I just think that there seems to be this understanding of the filling of the Spirit has some form of verbal expression to it. Now, this text is going to give us a little bit of understanding that potentially. Now, the text says, as we just read, it says, And do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Uh, I like the older version of that. Uh, my version actually says it was just debauchery. I think debauchery is one of the greatest biblical terms. It makes me sound like an old time fundamentalist, but you know, debauchery. You know, what is that? Interesting enough, this text doesn't say necessarily that wine leads to debauchery. Even though we would say that if you get drunk, you sometimes do things you later regret. Sometimes uh, your inhibitions are lowered and there's things that go on, and I'm sure nobody in this room has ever experienced that. Uh, but that happens. But it's interesting, there's a direct parallel here. It says being drunk with wine is debauchery. It's equating those two. So if you live a life that is filled with drunkenness, then it says that by itself is defined with debauchery. But it's also to understand, as you can go on in this verse, that the reason that is dangerous is because you have given control of yourself to something else. Now we know in today's terms it tends to be just that it lowers your inhibitions, but in certain cultures they believe the wine actually infiltrated people with some of the uh, actions that they have. I think that was true in the Christian community. But when we look at that, we, we want to make sure these things, first of all, there's this contrast. So what's the contrast? Drunk with wine and then full of the Spirit. Well, it's what's controlling you. So what's controlling you at any moment? The wine or the Spirit? And so he says, don't do one, but do the other. Now, I'm not going to go into a biblical theological understanding of can you drink or can you not. Um, I believe that's an issue of freedom. In the scriptures, uh, but drunkenness is spoken about as something that goes over the line. But here in this text, that's not his emphasis. His emphasis is to make a parallel between that drunkenness and then what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And it's very interesting in that text that it's not a one time event. This verbal use of a verb here is a continually ongoing experience. So it's something that you experience ongoing in your life. So it's not like baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I would suggest in the scriptures is a one-time event. This is different. It's something that perhaps you could be filled and then not filled, but it's something that he is calling you forth in a continuous process. The second thing that's interesting about the way it's phrased is that it is a passive imperative. Now I know you really want to get into Greek of this, and I even make some references to Greek this morning, but it helps understand the text a little bit. But the uh, what that actually means, we think about an imperative that is passive, it's basically also used in the middle sense of the Greek to say, you're allowing something to happen to you. So it's not totally passive, but it's opening yourself up for something else to happen to you. And he is saying here that you need to open yourself up, you need to be available for the Spirit to fill you. Now what does that mean? Well, <clears throat> There's a lot of texts that talk about it, but in this text, I want to give you four things here that are either means by which you are filled, or they are evidences by which you are filled. Now, I grew up believing and being taught that these four things that we're going to see are evidences. They are the things that you actually do if you are filled with the Spirit. But the Greek could actually use this terminology either as a result or as a cause. In other words, the things that we're going to talk about are things also that can cause you or lead you to be filled with the Spirit. I don't really want to make a choice between those two. Because I think the truth is that as you do these things, you are expressing what it means to be filled with the Spirit, but you are also opening yourself up to be filled by the Spirit, because it's not something you're just doing on your own, but you're actually doing in the community of believers. And that's so important in this text. To realize that in this text, we're talking about how does the body of Christ function together. So what are those four Ways to be filled with the Spirit or potentially evidences 
to be filled of uh, being filled with the Spirit. Well, it starts in uh, verse 19. It says, Be filled with the Spirit first, is speaking to one another in worship song, or speaking to one another in song. He says it this way, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So three things, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We are to speak to one another in these. And we're going to get, in the next part of the verse, it's going to talk about do this in your heart to the Lord. So it's not an either or here, but what's interesting here is that what he's basically saying is that when you're filled with the Spirit, when you do these things, it actually ministers to those around you. You are to speak, sing these things one to another. And I think that's important. In another passage in the book of Acts, Paul is said to have gone back to all the places and planted churches, and he would gather them, and what he said he did to them was encourage them as they, as they saw or persecuted in light of the coming of the kingdom. So here they are. They need to be encouraged. And I think one of the key ways that we encourage each other is through singing. Uh, we sing songs, and those hopefully encourage us. Now, there's three types of songs mentioned here. And some people brush over this and say he's not making any distinction. Uh, in my studies, I think there's a distinction between these three. Uh, the first one is psalms. Now, I don't think anywhere in the text of Scripture ever uses that for any other terminology other than the psalms that we currently have in the Old Testament. Uh, so it's the psalms of the Old Testament. It's what one theologian has called the, the hymn book or the song book of the church. And I think that's a great description. And what I have uh, seen is that some songs that we sing are actually just verses of the songs put to music. I think I may have shared this story one time before, but an individual that was in my former church and I were talking about music. He was in the choir and uh, just, you know, he loved singing. Uh, he was actually from Denmark. And so in talking to him, I was kind of hearing a little bit of his background. Because you have to understand where I came from. You couldn't sing with the music, and you could only sing the songs. And that was it. That's all they allowed in their churches. Well, on one hand, it's great that they did that. But we're going to see in this text, that's not to limit us to songs, but that should be part of what we do, is singing them, maybe even reading them to one another. And so you have songs. Then secondly, uh, you have hymns. Now, there's a lot of modern description of what a hymn is. Uh, I think in the biblical times, it, it had two components to it. One is it taught theology or truths about God. So hymns were a little heavier in content on teaching people truths about God. And then it was sung in a rhythm or pattern that was easily learned and repeated. And so it's kind of interesting that a lot of our song, or a lot of our hymns, are written in the same metric form. Now, I'm not a musician, so I'm not going to get into a lot of that. Uh, but they do that because you'll even find a lot of times a, a song or a hymn of the old church was written, and then music was put to it years later. Or sometimes it was written with one set of music, and then it changed over time. So a lot of the hymns that you sing were the original words, but actually the tune has changed over the years. And so this idea of hymns isn't just about traditional songs or contemporary songs, but a style of song. And so if you are familiar with current music, if you listen to the Gettys, uh, the Gettys write modern-day hymns. And so they are hymns or songs that are written for the purpose of communicating good theology and to do that in a way that is easily uh, sung by a congregation. Now the third group is the one that's really hard to pin down exactly what he means. He says spiritual songs. Spiritual songs. Now this same term spiritual is used when he talks about spiritual gifts. And so what I think this is, is that it is a more spontaneous song that is given to somebody within the body of Christ in order to encourage and exhort the people. So it could be a reflective song, it could be uh, something else. And so I think a lot of our modern day songs probably fit into that. Uh, they're probably not as deep theologically, but they speak very much of someone's experience in their walk with the Lord. And so that is some. Now, what I want us to walk away from is not getting hung up. You agree or disagree with all this. Um, but here's the emphasis. We can sing and do one another and with one another five vast different set of songs. From hymns to songs themselves to spiritual songs. They're all open to us to use. 
to encourage one another and to sing to our Lord. Oftentimes in our current discussion, uh, it gets stuck on style. And so we hear, is it contemporary or is it traditional? Well, this transcends that because a hymn can be traditional or it can be contemporary. A spiritual song can be a contemporary or traditional. I, I could go through some of those popular songs that you've probably sung from hymn books in the past and say, okay, does that really fit the mode more of a spiritual song or a hymn? And sometimes we get those kind of, we join them together, but you do a little reading on this, you realize that most people make a separation of what those are, but the joy is that we get to enjoy them all. Now, three things real quick, just uh, from me, so you hear my desires as your pastor. And we've had a lot of discussions recently, both most of it kind of behind the scenes, but uh, about music and worship and what do we do, what do we not do. And let me give you three things that are in my heart. One is I want to find music that represents your heart language while also challenging you to be open to new songs. Now that doesn't have just on us. Anybody that's putting a worship service together to make sure there's a balance there of songs that the body of Christ knows and can sing together. And then that we don't introduce so many new songs that you get lost. Um, and sometimes well, we've been guilty of that, especially in recent months. It's like every time it's two new songs, and I'm not sure what they are. And so we need to spend some time learning them together, even if they're new. But my hope is that we can find a good balance between those two expressions, both what has perhaps been in your heart language and others. It's interesting, I, I asked uh, some time ago, you know, if you have any favorite hymns, write them down. We'd love to know what they were. Um, I can tell you that we have a lot of different hymn traditions in this church. Uh, because they were on one polar spectrum to the other as far as whether you would have sung it from a Presbyterian hymnal, uh, an Episcopal hymnal, or a good old Southern Gospel hymnal. Uh, these are different styles of music. And yet, we have people in this room that have had experience and all of those songs mean something to us. Sometimes you sing a song or you even hear a song. There's songs that, as a young person, I didn't really like them. I was like, I don't like that damn. And now I hear it, it's like, oh, I love that song. It's because it's part of my faith heritage. And so it brings those memories back. The second thing is that we balance reverence and celebration. <laughs> balance reverence and celebration. What I mean by that is there are songs that we just fall at the feet of our Lord. And we worship Him for His holiness, His greatness, and who He is. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. I mean, those are the songs that we sing with a deep sense of reverence. There's also songs that we sing for celebration. And if you look at the New Testament, what is normally talked about when they talk about songs are that we are singing thanksgiving and praise to the Lord. That's an amen from God. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> if not, uh, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you think about that, reverence and celebration, so that we celebrate the life that we have in Christ together and we sing about that. And you see that throughout Scripture, where those two things are both used. So we want to do that here. And finally, we want to involve those gifted in music to lead us all in worship. I don't. God decided not to give me the gift of music. Uh, can't sing particularly well. I'm not the worst I've ever heard, but I'm not a particularly good singer. Um, give me a little bit of uh, Charlie Daniels, and I can probably hang, but you know, go beyond that, I might not be there. Uh, also, I, I can't seem to play an instrument. I, I bought the guitar years ago. It's hanging on my wall in the upper room that we call it, where I have meetings, and it's there, and it's really pretty. Uh, I just never could really get it, and you know, part of that takes practice, right? And so part of it's practice, and the other is just understanding rhythm and all those things. That's not my area, but you know what? There are people in this group that have those gifts. And in fact, I'm so thankful that uh, Barry stepped up and Penny have stepped up to help us uh, in that, because they have an opportunity to use their gifts, not for their own glory, but instead, like that bottle, to fill us up to help us enter in to worship. So if you have gifts in those areas, you need to let us know. We'd love for you to use them. And you might say, well, I don't like singing in front of people. We'll put you behind the pole over here. We <laughs> don't have to see you that way. But we can hear your beautiful voice, and you can help lead us in worship. Okay, so that's enough on the Psalm 10s and spiritual songs. The second thing that we see is a command in here, what it means to be filled, is to sing from the heart. Sing from the heart. Verse uh, 19 at the end says, singing and make melody to the Lord with your heart. So on one hand, you're singing to one another, but now he says you're singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Let's not separate those two. Let's understand those both happen in the same event. 
the real question becomes this, is your worship an expression of the heart, or is it just simply a rote memory? You know, there's so many songs that can be sung, and I can just mouth them, because I've sung them so many times. And sometimes, I get to realize that I'm not even connecting with the lyrics, with the words, with the worship. So I need to check my own heart and say that in this moment, am I entering into the worship of the Lord? Even sometimes a song that I don't particularly like the tune. It's important to be able to say, I'm going to listen to the words. And are the words edifying to Jesus? Is it edifying to his people? then I can enter into worship. The story is told, it's not an old story, it's uh, about the, in the 1990s. Some of you may have heard the name Matt Redmond. He's written a lot of songs uh, in, since the 80s and forward. And Matt Redmond was a worship pastor at a church in England. And his pastor became quite concerned because of two things. One, he felt like there was a lot of people that would just come to worship and they would go through a rote memory of things. But then there also began, began to be big conflict in the church because they were introducing the praise band and all this new worship music which Matt Redmond was, was part of and there was conflict in the church and so this began to be factions you know, kind of going to the pastor and saying we need this, we need that and finally the pastor said okay we're not doing any more music on Sunday morning we're removing the band and he said we're just going to come and we're going to pray and we're going to see what God leads us to and through that, in fact, people did start singing a cappella without the music, and that began to blossom. And it says that people's hearts become to come back to the Lord. Because he asked this question When you come through the doors on a Sunday, what are you bringing as your offering to the Lord? You realize that's what you're doing in singing? You're bringing your offering of worship and praise to the Lord. Do I hope you feel encouraged by what you sing and hear? Yeah. But even more so, I pray that you're coming with the attitude, what am I bringing as an offering of worship to the Lord? It says that Matt Redman was bothered at first by the embarrassing silence that would occur in the worship when, when they didn't have music, but eventually they began to feel heartfelt prayers and testimonies and yes, even singing. Through that, he wrote this song. Maybe you heard it. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of work that will bless your heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made, when it's all about you, Jesus. He wrote that song, and they reintroduced the praise band all the worship back into their service and the legacy of that church. And our worship is still being sung by us today. My challenge for us is, let's be sure that when we come and worship together, that our number one goal is that we are bringing an offering to our worthy Lord. Third thing he talks about in this is to cultivate gratitude. Cultivate gratitude. And remember, these are things to be done together as the family of God. This is what it says. Giving thanks always and for everything. Okay, you got those two? That kind of, and it's everything. It's not a time constraint, and there's not a circumstance constraint. At all times, in all things, we are to be giving thanks to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of the hardest concepts in all of Scripture. For someone who thinks that it's all about them. Because sometimes we realize we may be going through something that because of the way we respond to it in our walk with the Lord, that someone else comes to faith or is encouraged in the faith, and it wasn't about us, it was about what God is going to do in those circumstances at that moment through you. And to me, that's the greatest thanksgiving. That's the greatest thanksgiving. That God has used something that you have offered for his glory and in the lives of another. We need to recognize God's goodness and faithfulness in all circumstances. We need to practice our thanksgiving, and part of that helps us align our hearts to the spirit of God's work. There's a legend of a man who found a barn, and in that barn uh, was Satan's seeds to be sown into the human heart. 
Okay, so it's not true story. But he says it's kind of like On finding the seeds of discouragement more numerous than the other seeds, he learned what these seeds could be made to grow into almost anywhere. When Satan was questioned, he reluctantly admitted that there was one place in which he could not sow the seeds of discouragement. So if somebody asked him, where is that? Luther says that would be in the heart of a grateful person. See, it's hard to be a complainer and to be grateful at the same time. So as we orient ourselves to being grateful to the Lord, we may find that our discontentedness, our discouragement, and even our complaining spirit may go with it. And that's what it means to be filled with the spirit that pushes these other things out because we're so filled with the spirit. Finally, in this text we have to submit to one another in Ephesians 5, 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now it's interesting, everything else seems to be doing with worship. Singing, giving thanks, singing the hearts of the Lord, songs and spiritual songs. And then he adds this submitting to one another in reference to Christ. Now he's going to talk about how that works out in some relationships in the following verses. That will be our next series. But right now, in this context, I think submitting to one another sometimes means that even our issues of preference in music is sometimes set aside that we may submit to what ministers or help someone else express their offering to the Lord. Now, the way you do this is embrace humility and serve others out of reverence for Christ. Embrace humility and serve others out of reverence for Christ. That term reverence for Christ there simply means not because they are deserving it or not because you are so great, but you do it out of reverence for Christ. Now, think about this for a moment. Jesus Christ is the one who gave his life and sacrificed for us. And so he's going to use this picture later when he talks about the wrong life of the husband and wife and says Husbands, in the same way, you can give up your life for the sake of your life. And I think the same thing is true here. We give up our rights for the sake of someone else. One pastor put it this way. It's making someone else's deal more important than your deal. I like that. Make someone other stuff, other person's deal, more important than your deal. So prioritize unity and harmony within the body of believers by practicing the submission to one another. Now, leaving with this thought, a couple of reflection items as we close. One is, uh, examine your heart. Do you find yourself worshiping the Lord in fullness? Do you find yourself worshiping Him in thanksgiving? If not, just examine, Lord, where is my heart? And take that to Him. And express it if you're falling short. Worship him if he is filling your heart. And then finally, I would say, come on Sunday morning with that desire. That your desire is to bring an offering to the Lord that also edifies the believers. And you can do this through song. You can do it through testimony. You can do it by talking with one another after the service of the Lord. And whatever it be, come with this idea that I'm going to offer something and worship the Lord and of encouragement and edification. Let's pray. Father God, everything we face as individuals and as your church, you instruct us in your word and we are thankful for that. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to do so as we walk through this week and bring these things back to our mind. Lord, I also pray that in light of the weather, you keep everyone safe as they depart, uh, that we may gather back here again next Sunday to offer to you our worship and praise in Christ's name. Amen.